All right, so this is lecture 15, part two, the University of Texas at Austin, on the topic of quadratory amplitude modulation transmission. And this is for the real-time digital signal processing lab class in spring 2014. So we've already talked about PAM and how we can take two PAM signals with up conversion and put them in the same transmission bandwidth as one signal. And this now becomes quadrature amplitude modulation. We can think of this transmission as either being done uh, in the, just by subtracting two up converted PAM signals. Uh, we do that through implementation or by analysis. We can think of it as placing information in both the amplitude and the phase of a single sinusoid. So this is part two. So I, in part one, I, I covered through lecture nine. So we'll start on lecture nine. Lecture slide nine, sorry. OK, so we're left off at, with part one. And again, this is the implementation. And on the top half of the slide, it's the implementation. It's mostly in continuous time. And the bottom half is completely in discrete time until we hit the digital to analog converter. OK. So, we, you know, so the mapping here um, is what, so the bottom block diagram is what we'll do in lab, and it's what we've been doing in homework and simulation. But the, you can map the blocks from the top block diagram to the bottom block diagram. The first two are the same. We talked about this last time. So we, as we've seen even with PAM, we have a string of bits that come in, some stream of bits that are coming at us. We group them into a block of capital J bits, where J is the number of bits per symbol. If I have four QAM, four levels of QAM, that's two bits. J is two. I then go, th I take the J bits and I use that concatenation of those J bits that have appeared sequentially as a lookup, as a lookup, as an index into a lookup table. So this map to 2D constellation has a, has the, kind of the amplitudes of my constellation map, and those amplitudes now have two dimensions. They have, because we're going to ultimately combine two PAM signals in this QAM transmission. So we have the amplitude for the in-phase direction and the amplitude for the, for the quadrature direction. So here's the in-phase, and then here's the quadrature. So in, we're now going to basically take these J bits and map them to two different amplitudes. Each amplitude is still real valued. And then we'll proceed with PAM uh, modulation, or pulse amplitude modulation, for the subsequent two blocks, shown here as impulse modulator and uh, pulse shaping. And we do the same thing in discrete time. The implementation is analogous. So we're doing the same thing here in the bottom block diagram. So an example constellation map that we've seen already is 4QAM. It's the simplest one, and it's the one most commonly used. So I have an in-phase and quadrature component. And you can see that denoted by I and Q here in the block diagram. And if I want to put some points down in the constellation map, I'm still going to be uniformly spaced in those constellation points. So the, in the in-phase direction, I have D and minus D. In the quadrature direction, I have D and minus D. So D is still the same parameter, and it's going to be half of the spacing to the nearest constellation point. So here are the four points that I can put in. Let me make some room for the one I want to add. So four constellation points for four QAM. These are my symbol amplitudes. It just I have two of them to, to be worried about or to define. So I have this, this value, for example, is D in the in-phase direction and D in the quadrature direction. And we can actually write this, if we want to put this into a single expression, we can write it as a complex-valued uh, amplitude with a real and imaginary component. The real component is the in-phase direction, and the quadrature component uh, is the uh, 
quadra component is the imaginary component, and the in-face component is the real component. Now, if we look down here, so pick this value, I have d in the in-phase direction plus, actually minus, d in the quadrature direction. And if I look at this at any one, and we mentioned this already, if I look at, if I look along the in-phase axis, I see two QPAM. I just have two levels on the in-phase, in, only in the in-phase direction. I have levels at minus d and d. And if I isolate the quadrature direction, then I only have levels, let me change my colors here. So in the in-phase direction, I see d and minus d, and in the quadrature direction, I also see minus d and d. So it's 2 pam in the in-phase direction and 2 pam in the quadrature direction, and the cross product, it gives me four different possibilities. Now it's true that not all QAM constellations separate this nicely, but the ones that we deal with, um, almost without exception, will. There are a few, any, any 4 QAM, 16 QAM will have this type, and even mo most of the 8 QAMs will have this kind of structure to it. All right, so here's our constellation map. So we take J bits, and I have to encode. So I have two bits to encode here. So I can encode different ways. I can encode, uh, let's find, there we go. So I can encode here. This bit pattern could be, let's say, 0, 0. This could be 0, 1. This could be 1, 1. And this could be what's left, 1, 0. Okay. Now, any, any encoding will do, just as long as the receiver knows what the constellation map is. We can do any mapping we want to do, but there is a notion of a, of a, of a better map, a better way to do this. And what we're going to find when we do the receiver analysis is that when we go to detect on the receiver what, ampli what is the amplitude we actually receive at the receiver, it's going to be the transmitted amplitude plus a random number. It will be a random number in the in-phase direction, a random number in the quadrature direction, due to the additive noise in the channel. It's just inevitable. We're going to get noise. So if we want to, if we want to, if we get a similar error, what we'd like to do is minimize the number of bits that are in error. Okay. So if I transmit a zero zero, I'm in the upper quadrant. So I, if I do zero zero, I'm up here in the upper, upper quadrant. If my if I make a mistake, I'm more likely to be either in this quadrant or I'm going to be in this quadrant. Right? I'm less likely to be in this lower left quadrant. I have to be farther away from the, from the true constellation point. So I look at the closest distance to the next quadrant, it's going to be this lower right and upper left quadrants. Because I'm only d away from those, but I'm square root of 2 times d away from this lower left quadrant. So I'm less likely to make a, to have the received symbol amplitude estimate be in this lower left. So what I want to do in practice is use gray coding so that I, I don't, I, I, even if I make a symbol error, I at least want to get one of those bits right. Because if I get enough of the bits right, I might be able to use error correction and, and detect and fix that bit flip. So the, the encoding I would rather have than this one is, is what? How would you change this? How about upper left? Well, we could change the upper left. One zero, upper left. Or I could switch, switch encodings. I heard that. So I want one zero here. That way, right? So if I make a mistake, if I, if I send the D plus JD, but I decode, you know, minus D plus JD up in the upper left quadrant, I make a symbol error, but I only make one bit error. The other bit's correct. That's a good thing. Now I have to change the lower left, otherwise I have you know some real ambiguity here. All right. So on the lower left, what's left is one one. Okay. So if I look at any adjacent, any pair of adjacent constellation points, I'm only going to differ by one bit. Okay. So this is a nice thing called gray coding. We can do it in PAM as well. Right, just any two adjacent symbol amplitudes should be encoded. There'll only be one bit in difference. Go ahead. Is there a reason why we use like uh, D plus JD and D minus D? Is there a synaptic 
point line up with the actual speed. And you have the same basically the speed constellation point, but you have a lower average power. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm, this is just uniformly spaced. The question, I think, was uh, why do I want d plus jd? Uh, is there another way I could, yeah, there are other ways I can do this. I could rotate this 45 degrees, for example. Um, I could, but this is going to be less power consumption than 4pm, for example. But I'm not limited, so yeah, so I'm not limited to using QAM constellation maps that are, that I separate the in-phase direction from the quadrature. I don't have to do it this way. But we're going to start with this just as a, because now we can reuse what we learned in, about PAM. But you're right, we don't have to stay with this. And we could, we could rotate this 45 degrees and put the uh, constellation points on the axes. Lots of things we could do. Okay, so next up, after finding the symbol amplitude that we want for the in-phase and quadrature directions, we then go through the normal pulse amplitude modulation steps in the transmitter side, which is, uh, in the continuous time case, impulse modulation followed by pulse shaping. So the pulse shaping, you know, filter is FIR. The pulse shape is what we choose. Script raise cosine, raise cosine. Could be a sink, right? That's a roll-off factor of zero for the raise cosine. Could be a rectangular pulse, whatever it happens to be. On the, the version of this in discrete time uh, is upsampling. Because what we're really doing with the impulse modulation uh, is to really generate an impulse train whose impulses are separated by the symbol time. And we pulse shape to limit the bandwidth of that. Uh, impulse train. On discrete time, what we want to do is convert the, the uh, we're not going to associate a symbol rate with, because we're still in discrete time, we're going to have two clocks in our system. We're going to have a symbol rate and a sampling rate. So the sampling rate is ultimately what drives the D to A converter. And the sampling rate is now going to be obtained simply by upsampling. So if I upsample by L, what's the increase in the in the sampling rate from input to output? We have L times as many samples. So what's the increase? L times, right? So Fs is now L times F sim, and L is the number of samples. Um, per symbol period. It's also called the upsampling factor. So from a signal processing point of view, we call it an upsampling factor. From a communication systems point of view, we call it the number of samples per symbol. Same. It's the same thing. It's upsampling by L, but you can look at it two different ways. So now we've done the upsampling. Now we the output of the upsampler is mostly zeros, right? It's, it's half, half or zeros if L is 2, and mostly zeros if L is greater than 2. And so we have the pulse shaping here that's just the FIR filter in discrete time that will connect the dots, that is to say connect the amplitude values that we know, in the in-phase direction. That is to say smooth out those transitions to all those zeros in between the symbol amplitudes that we know. And then finally we upconvert, or not finally, but at least in the, the PAM side of this, we upconvert in by a cosine. And that cosine has a fixed frequency omega naught, and we can tie that back to a carrier frequency F naught. So, omega, so if this is a carrier frequency F naught, then we know that omega naught is what? How do we get there? Two pi times F naught divided by the sampling rate. But which which rate? Which we have two clocks. Fs. Very good. Because once we once we finish the upsampler, our sampling rate our, our rate of sampling is now Fs. It's a sampling rate used by the DDA converter. Prior to that, the input to the upsampler, we're working at, with symbol amplitudes and are working with things at the symbol rate. So we're two different clocks, but they're related to each other. Yeah. Now, the lower branch is just more of the same. Lower branch is, I know I have a, I have a quadrature amplitude modulated uh, symbol amplitude, real number, Q of n. n is my symbol index, little m is my sample index. I upsample pulse shape, and now I upconvert using the sine, so I'm 90 degrees out of phase with the, with the cosine, and I subtract the two. To get a single real-valued signal, as this 
the S here, and I've indexed it as, as little m. Again, m is the sample index. Again, little n is the symbol index. And then that goes through the D to A converter, and we now have S of T. So the operations on the lower block diagram should give the same transmitted signal as the upper block diagram in theory. Now, of course, in practice, we have, you know, uh, we have effects on the choice of how many bits per, you know, word we use and the coefficients of the FIR filter, uh, how we represent the symbol amplitude. There are a lot of things, obviously, that are going to, in the implementation, there'll be a little bit of a variability from the upper block diagram to the lower block diagram. But in theory, we're doing the same steps. It's just that we moved all of the processing in the bottom block diagram into discrete time and then use a DDA converter to get our continuous time analog waveform out for baseband QAM transmission. Now, subsequent to this, either block diagram, we may have a, you know, we're going to have carrier circuits. We may have an additional up conversion step to a much higher frequency carrier, for example, radio frequency uh, carrier. In certain scenarios, this end, so if we do underwater communications, for example, we have lower bandwidths, we're in the, we're below, we're in the ten of kilohertz, tens of kilohertz range. Uh, we may just do all this in discrete time and be done with it. We would not have another step of up conversion. We'd already be high enough carrier frequency here in discrete time. Another trick, I'll tell you the trick we another trick that sometimes happens if you don't have another up conversion stage. I guess even if you do, there's a nice trick here. It turns out we're going to talk about the DDA, but we know in the DDA there's a there's a filter in there. It's a low pass filter is interesting. So we can actually sometimes get away with not using pulse shaping and let the filter at the D to A take care of business for us. Uh, we do this in some cases. It, it's a little bit tricky to do this. They don't have the same uh, passband values for the pulse shaping versus what's in the D to A. But sometimes I'm telling you, practice will actually drop the pulse shaping and just let the D to A do the work for us just to get rid of one more filter in the system. Okay, so this is the baseband side, and then again, we may have some additional steps on the before ultimate transmission through the channel. Go ahead. Can you have more than two dimensions? Uh, absolutely. So what are the, so how can you get more than two dimensions? Uh, the, they start to interfere with each other. So if I, if I put, yeah, if it's just, or I'm just dividing up the, so we have lots of resources that we can allocate for communications. So uh, time is one of them, frequency is another. And here we're taking the, the best we can do out of one, making use of one transmission band. We're putting two PAM signals into one transmission band. Um, that, that's, a use, that's a better use of frequency <laughs> resources. We also have time. So we can allocate different users for different, in different time slots. That's another dimension. We can use multiple transmitters, physical transmitters, for example, antennas, and now I have a spatial dimension. I can separate users by a PN, a PN code. We do this in, in uh, 2G CDMA and 3G CDMA. So each user broadcasts same time and same frequency band, but is broadcasting them with a different uh, point in the PN sequence. And so the users look like noise. To the, so if, yeah, so each user would, so you have a very long PN sequence, could be, you know, hundreds of days, and if you have 30 users in a, in a base station cell, then you can have each user starting at a different point in that PN sequence. And all the other users, since they don't, since if you're one, one sample off in your PN sequence, it, it's uncorrelated, it looks like noise. So all the other users look like noise. The base station knows how to pull out each user by correlating against the right PN sequence with a phase offset or a time offset, it now it's synchronized to each user. But to each other, the users look like noise when they when they reach the base station. So it's another um, resource we can allocate. The fast Fourier transform breaks up a frequency uh, transmission bandwidth into multiple narrow subbands or narrow band channels, and we can transmit a different QAM signal on each one. It's another so lots of dimensions that we can use here. And there are higher dimension codes, don't get me wrong. There are higher dimension modulation schemes in QAM. 
But what's used in practice to get more dimensions just for simplicity of implementation would be more antennas, uh, the FFT, because now I have, for every FFT coefficient, I can have a QAM signal, and uh, time, and frequency. We divide them all up this way. Code division, still around. We're frequency hopping in Bluetooth, so we still use some games with how we, we use uh, frequency domain, the two kinds of, of uh, uh, kind of spread spectrum approaches. It's another, another resource to use. Um, so yes, lots of dimensions to use. And, yeah, and there are also higher dimension modulation methods. They just get really more, co the complexity goes up quite high beyond two dimensions. Okay. So there are lattice codes if you want to look that up, just to see higher dimensional codes. They do exist. All right, so again, this is, this is a huge slide because this is lab six. The bottom, the bottom half is lab six. This is pretty important. All right, so we're going to use, so the bits are going to be PN generated typically. So that's lab four. Uh, filtering is lab three, sinusoidal uh, signals are lab two. PAM modulation is lab five. So if you remember also, there's a lab view simulation for this QAM transmission at baseband that you can run as well with all the all these blocks in it. And and also shows you different uh, signals that come out of the, or different ways to, to view the baseband transmission S of T as a time signal, as an eye diagram, and as a constellation map. So that's all, that's available for download, right, from the course website. All right, so let's go ahead and move on to some analysis of this uh, transmission. And for communication systems, again, for general signal quality, we're going to start with what measure? Where do we start? Signal noise ratio. And this works across application domains as the first way to measure signal quality. Typically not the last, but it's a good first start. Now, for us, we've already seen that for 2 PAM and even for multi-level PAM, the next level of signal quality is to look at the probability of making an error in the receiver, of making a mistake in trying to estimate the, the bit pattern that had been transmitted, the probability of symbol error. And that probability of symbol error was a, was a function of what for, for PAM? What did that look like? Well, we derive it here, but for PAM, do you remember what that looked like? So it's a probability of error. What did that look like? There was some constant, and that constant didn't vary much. It was between 1 and 2 in value. And what was the rest of it? Q function. Q function. Very good. So there's a Markham Q function, and the argument? Square root of what? Yeah. Squared is something involving S and R. So inside was something which was another constant times the square root of S and R. That was the form of the probability of symbol error. And then we can go through and define C naught was like, uh, let's see what C naught was. We can derive, we'll derive it here. So what C naught was something like that. And then C1 was, was more complicated. So we'll, we'll, see, we'll see these constants. What, what, matters, what, what matters in all of this is the square root of S and R. So as S and R increases, that's the biggest change here. This is S and R in linear units, not dB. So as S and R increases, what happens to the probability of an error, symbol error? S and R goes up, goes down, and way down. So we know that this decline in the probability of symbol error rate is proportional to it's basically an exponential uh, decrease. So for any SNR and linear units that increases, 
I get an exponential decrease in, a, in the probability of symbol error, a huge drop. A little bit of gain in SNR, huge, huge improvement in the probability of symbol error. All right, so let's go ahead and derive this again, and this time we're going to include the effect of the symbol time, which we had normalized out previously. We just set the symbol time to 1, and we'll compare this to QAN. Okay, now we're assuming again at the receiver we do the opposite operations. At the receiver, we're going to have uh, match filtering on, on both the, inf well, in this case, it's if we're, we're doing PAM here. For PAM, we just have uh, match filtering and then sample at the symbol time, which means down sample by L, and then make a decision. So the block diagram for PAM at the receiver, I have the match filter. I sample at the symbol time, and I get an estimate of the symbol amplitude. And from that, I make a decision. This decision is, you know, which, which bit pattern was most likely to have been transmitted. And I make a mistake some of the time. And so what I'll see on this, uh, so if we assume that the sampling here is done correctly in the receiver, I'm synchronized to the transmitter. I have exactly the knowledge, exact knowledge of the symbol time and when the symbol time samples are taken. Perfectly synchronized. I have no memory in the channel. Only additive noise is the only impairment in the channel. Then... The only thing that's going to throw me off in making a decision is the additive noise in the channel. That's my only impairment in the system. So again, so if we sample the match filter output at the correct time instances, which are, you know, n is my symbol index, so integer multiples of the symbol time, and without any ISI, which means there's no memory, there's no inter symbol interference, there's no memory in the channel, the receive signal looks like the transmitted so what is it? The estimated, this is my estimated symbol, amplitude. Looks like the transmitted symbol, amplitude S, plus noise. And again, the, the transmitted symbol amplitudes have the same formula as before. Talked about this already. This will generate the possible values. So here I show you the four-level PAM constellation on the right. So the constellation spacing is 2 times little d. Right? That's the spacing between any two adjacent symbol amplitude values. And we're assuming that you know, V of t here is, our, is basically this is the output of the match filter, uh, given that the input is the, is the additive noise in the channel, and this additive noise has a Gaussian distribution with zero mean and variance sigma squared. Uh, this receive filter um, is going to pass frequencies from half the symbol rate to minus half the symbol rate. Also makes sense from a signal processing point of view because the match filter is serving as the anti-aliasing filter before we sample at the symbol time. So we want that match filter to uh, reduce frequencies at or above half the symbol rate because we're sampling at the symbol rate just to satisfy the sampling theorem as best we can. Okay, so this, um, so now we're, you know, now we're going to bring in our symbol rate and not set it to 1 like we did earlier. And so if we remember earlier, I did mention that, that if we do send um, a, a random signal, a Gaussian random signal, through a low-pass filter, the mean is scaled by the DC response of the filter. This is for a low-pass filter. Now, in our case, the mean's already zero from our noise. The noise already has a zero mean. So the mean stays zero. And the variance is, is multiplied by twice the bandwidth of the filter. And the bandwidth here is half the symbol rate. So we scale the variance by the symbol rate, or equivalently, we divide the variance by the symbol time. So there's now an impact. So the symbol time, the, the, symbol, the choice of symbol time affects the noise power that gets through the match filter. 
So if the symbol time is greater than zero, the variance is reduced. If the symbol time is less than zero, the variance is increased. There's an impact. Another way to look at this is we can take all the derivations that we've already done, and wherever you see sigma, you can replace sigma by sigma divided by the square root of T sim, and all the old derivations that we did on lecture uh, 13, lecture 14 slides on match filtering uh, would apply. But we're going to do it here from scratch. Okay, so for Pam, we've got two possible uh, types of decision regions. So again, PAM is just one dimension. So here I just show the constellation map horizontally instead of vertically. It's the same map. So here I show 8 PAM. And oh, just as an aside, if I were to gray code this, see, yeah, if I'm going to get myself into trouble to gray code this, um, I'll make it easy on myself. We'll go back to 4 PAM. Let's gray code this before we move on. So if I, let's see, pick, uh, let's see, it's 4 PAM. How many bits per symbol? Two? All right, so let's gray code this. That would gray code it. Now, that's not the two's complement coding, right? The two's complement would be Minus, you know, minus one. So two's complement I mean the most negative number in terms of absolute value would be one zero, and then minus one would be one one. This is not the two's complement encoding that we would normally think of using as a quantizer, and say an A to D converter. But it is. This is the gray code to, to reduce the number of bit errors when we make a symbol error. All right. Let's get back to eight pam. Okay, so as before, we have two different types of decision regions. We have outer points and inner points. The outer points are going to have less symbol error, and the inner points are going to have more symbol error. But what's the downside? The outer points have less symbol error, but they need more what? Power. So the trade-off. All right, so let's look at the decision uh, errors that can happen. So if I set an interior constellation point, then what I receive, so I'm going to send in a value, a symbol amplitude value of minus D. What I receive, after I go through the match filter and I sample at the symbol time, what I get at that point is the transmitted symbol amplitude plus a random number. That random number follows a Gaussian distribution. That Gaussian distribution now has a variance. Instead of sigma squared, it's sigma squared divided by T sim by the symbol time. So what you'll see here on the formula is they look exactly like we've done before, except that now I replace sigma the sigma divided by the square root of T sim. And then because I do that, the, the square root of T sim kicks up in the numerator um, as a result. So again, for the interior for an interior constellation point, the PDF that, that I would see would be Gaussian. So it's two-sided, and, and I can make a mistake. in either of two directions. And so there's my PDF of the, of the symbol amplitudes that I actually received, the estimated symbol amplitude. So it's a transmitted symbol amplitude plus a random number. So in other words, I'm just basically shifting the mean here of my Gaussian distribution. And so I want to integrate the tails in both directions. That's my probability of error. So it's two. So a Q function gives me the error in one tail. Two times the Q function gives me the error in two tails. For the outer points, I only make a mistake in one direction. I have the same PDF. But if I know that I send an amplitude of 7D, Okay.
I meant to be symmetric, just viewed as symmetric. All right, so the only trouble I can get into is along that tail. So my thresholds here that I would use are going to be where I draw these vertical lines. All right, so if I, if on the decision device, what I'm going to do is compare the re estimated symbol amplitude first against zero. All right, well, I'm going to do this efficiently, and you already told me how to do it, which is binary search. So I compare the, the re estimated symbol amplitude against zero to know if I'm either in up to the right or to the left of zero. And then if I'm to the left, I'll, I'll compare against 4D to know if I'm left or right of, sorry, minus 4D. All right, so first we'll compare against zero, then we'll compare against minus 4D. I know I'm left of that, so now I compare against minus 6D. So to figure out what's the, the closest constellation point of this possible symbol amplitude used by the transmitter, I only need three comparisons. It's just a number of bits. It doesn't make any sense to just walk through every one of the eight to figure out which is the closest one. It's very inefficient. Okay. So I, if, I, if I land, if I transmit the outer constellation point, then I'm going to make a mistake only in one direction. I don't make a mistake if the noise is negative, which pushes me out here. I don't, need, I don't make a mistake when comparing against minus 6D, when I'm transmitting minus 7D, minus 7 times D. Okay. All right, so that's the Q function by itself it is a decision error for the outer points. Doesn't matter whether if I'm on the outer point at minus seven times d or the outer point at seven times d, the same issue arises. It's just one direction to make a mistake in. If I combine the possibilities, I have m minus two over capital M interior points. I have one over m points that are the outer point to the right, one over m possibility outer point to the left. I can just combine this with the same formula. As before, the only difference is I now see the explicit role of T-SIM. All right, so now if I look at that, what happens if I increase the symbol time? What happens to the probability of error, symbol error? If I increase the symbol time, what happens? It'll decrease. Well, I'll have lots of noise over that symbol interval. But what do I also get to observe over that symbol interval? The transmitted signal. So the longer I get in time in the receiver to apply the match filter, in other words, that match filter is going to be, I'm smoothing over more samples, or in this case, more seconds. So the symbol time is increased. My match filter works over a longer period of time before we take the sample at the output of the match filter, I get a, you know, I get a better, uh, I, I filter out more noise. So this is a way to quantify that. So my S and R, remember it's inside of here, I'm proportional to the square root of S and R somehow. So again, if I, if I increase the symbol time, I decrease the probability of symbol error. If I increase D, which is half the constellation spacing, I increase the signal power, I also get an increase in S and R, and I get a decrease in the probability of symbol error. If the noise power increases, as I say sigma increases, the probability of symbol error goes up. Okay, so these are the three main parameters that are involved. And M, M plays a role, certainly. Because whatever M is, that's going to set my peak and average power at the transmitter side. So it plays a role in the actual transmit power that I start with before it goes through the channel, both peak power and average power. All right, let's go through QAM analysis. We'll do with 4 QAM to start with, but we'll do 16 QAM. And from there, we can get anything uh, from 16 QAM, any regularly spaced QAM constellation. That's rectangular in shape. And we can actually use it for things that are not rectangular, actually. All right, so QAM, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to assume that I've got the QAM receiver. I've got two, two PAM receivers in parallel follow, that follow a sinusoidal modulation, one by cosine, one by sine. 
and I'm assuming that I've got exact, I've got perfect synchronization at the receiver. The same thing's going to happen. So at the receiver, the output of the sampling block after the match filter is going to look the same. I'm going to have the receipt. This is going to be the estimated symbol amplitude, just like before. This is going to be the received amplitude, the transmitted amplitude, plus noise. It's the same story. The difference is I have two dimensions of PAM to worry about instead of one. I can generate the, the values of the QAM symbol amplitudes in the same way. Again, I have really, I've got PAM in the in phase direction, I've got PAM in the quadrature direction. So I can just reuse the formulas that I know how to generate those symbol amplitudes. So the in-phase formula, the same story as before. And the quadrature formula, the, for the quadrature component, it's going to be the same formula because that's just PAM. So again, I have PAM in the in-phase direction in red. I have PAM in the quadrature direction in blue. Separable. Uh, this bit, now, this is where it gets a little interesting. So that means that I've got the transmitted symbol I can think of. It's really two-dimensional PAM. That means that the receiver, I've also got noise in both the in-phase and quadrature component. And the way that this model, the way we're going to go about the derivation doesn't exist in practice. It's a bound. So there's this warning here on that. So the a standard assumption in the analysis, which is good to get a bound, but just to worry that we're not going to get there in, in practice, is that the in-phase noise, the noise on the in-phase PAM channel and the noise on the quadrature PAM channel are statistically independent. But they have no relationship with each other. That should bother you. I see some faces that aren't happy. And so why are they not independent? Well, these are in the receiver. This, are, this is the in-phase channel in the receiver and the quadrature channel in the receiver. Where does the noise come from in the in-phase and quadrature channels? Do they have a common source? Yeah. Yes. What is that common source? It's the, it's the additive noise in the channel. So, of course, they're going to be statistically dependent. This is a silly assumption. But, boy, it helps in the derivation. So this is a gets us to a bound. Let's go through this. So we'll do 16 QAM because once we do this, we can get any QAM constellation, and 4 QAM is a special case. So we have three constellation regions or decision regions instead of two. I have interior points. We've seen that before. I have interior points. I have corner points that look like quarter planes. Right? This, this goes out in infinite directions, both in the quadrature and in-phase directions. And I have this other type of constellation decision region, which is a edge that's not a corner. Three different possibilities. We'll look at the probability of error of each and then kind of combine them. So for an interior point, we're going to go with correct detection, and then we'll do one minus correct to get the error. So for correct detection, the in-phase noise and the quadrature noise have to be small enough in absolute value to keep the, re the estimated symbol amplitude inside one of our interior point. One of our in so let's say we want to transmit that symbol amplitude. We're trying to say, well, we don't make a mistake as long as all the re received symbol amplitudes, the estimated symbol amplitudes, fall into this uh, rectangular region, so square region. And that's true if the in-phase noise is less than D in absolute value and the quadrature component of the noise is less than D in absolute value. I'm staying in that same decision region. Now, if we assume it's statistically independent, then this and now becomes a product. This makes it easier on us. And now we can reuse what we learned in PAM. Now we're back to looking at two PAM signals, probability of correct detection of the in-phase component separately from the, the PAM signal and the quadrature component. And if we look at how can we get into trouble, two different ways in the in-phase direction from what I show in green, 
and two different ways in the quadrature direction. So in the in-phase direction, I get two times the Q function, the probability of error, and two times the Q function in the quadrature direction. I'm doing probability of correct, which is a little bit, a little more work to do it this way, but it's just the way I decided to do it. So that the probability of correct is, you know, probability of correct here is one minus the probability of error. And so our, our combined answer for probability of correct detection is one minus two times Q squared. Okay, let's go on to type two and type three. So for type two, it's a very long rectangle. All right, so pick a, pick a type two here. I'm not sure the, the right one, but so here's type two. This is a very long rectangle because it goes out to minus infinity in the in phase direction, but in the quadrature direction, it's limited in height by 2D. Right? So this direction is 2 times D, the height. It's fine. So the probability of getting correct detection, well, let's see, the in phase direction has to be. Uh, less than D and the quadrature in absolute value has to be less than D. So let's find out which point this is. So in, to be correct, the in-phase has to be less than D. That would be the one I actually got it right, I think. Yeah, that's the one. And also the one just below it would also work. Okay, so it's, again, assuming statistical independence, then this, uh, the and just becomes a product of the probabilities. So in the in-phase direction, I can only get in trouble one way. And in the, sorry, in the in-phase direction, one way. In the quadrature direction, I get in trouble in two ways. So if in the in-phase direction, it's just the Q function for the probability of error, 1 minus Q for probability of correct. In the quadrature direction, it's, it's 2 times the Q because I have two directions I can get in trouble in. Type 3 detection, these are quarter planes. I can only get in trouble in one direction in the in phase dire direction and only one in the in phase dimension and only one direction in the quadrature because I'm up in a, in a quarter plane. So if I'm up here, uh, again, I don't remember which one I'm at here, but if I'm up here, I can only get in trouble in one direction for the in phase. If the in phase is positive, it's not going to bother me in terms of the random number that, that's there at the input of the, the decision device. And in the quadrature direction, if the random number is positive, I don't make a mistake. I don't get in trouble in one direction. So I end up with, um, again, the, the, the and here because of statistical independence becomes, again, the product of what we know from PAM. And I end up with 1 minus just the Q function squared. And if I put this together, the probability of error, some algebra, then for, uh, I've got eight, so if I look at QM16, I've got eight edge points that are not corners. I have four interior points. Which one is that, left or right in this expression? Which one's the interior point? Left or right? Left. That's a two times the key function. So here's the interior points, and that leaves this to be the corner. The corner points have less error, but they need more power. And if you do the math on this probability of correct, is a quadratic in Q. And if you do one minus that, it's still a quadratic in Q. It's just the constant goes away. I end up with, you know, a Q function times 3 minus 9 fourths the Q squared function. So a couple insights. If the Q is really small, like we see in wireline communications, let's say 10 to the minus 7 for DSL or 10 to the minus 4 in power line, uh, how important is the Q squared term if we know the probability of simply 10 to the minus 4? Negligible, because Q squared is 10 to the minus 8. So this, this Q squared term can be neglected. But in wireless scenarios, um, underwater scenarios, 
this is important. That Q, that Q is 10 to the minus 1, 10 to the minus 2. Q squared becomes important. All right, last thing to finish up on. Uh, I guess two things before we, we break. Just hang in there. Okay. So if this is 16 QAM, how do I make this 4 QAM? All right, so 4 QAM looks like, so here's 4 QAM, four constellation points. What decision regions are there? One, two, or three? They're all three. So all I have to do is reuse the result for three. Okay, pick another one. Pick 8 QAM. We use that in DSL quite a bit, although I won't give you the one. In DSL, it's more complicated than what I'm going to draw you. All right, let's do 8 QAM. So that's 3D, D, minus D, minus 3D in phase quadrature. It's rectangular. Okay, so I have to draw some decision regions through the midpoints, also the axes. What region is out there? One, two, or three? Three, it's a corner. What about this one in the, right there? It's a two. Just reuse the results. Four out of eight times it's a corner point that's, it's an edge point that's on a corner. Four out of eight times it's a corner point. And you can do this for any constellation. 64 QAM, it doesn't matter. I think on a test I, I gave a ridiculously big a constellation and asked you to look at it on a previous midterm. Yeah. Only three terms that result. There are only three constellation you know, region, decision regions. Last one is power. And we've done this already, so for 4 QAM, for 4 PAM, we've already shown that the peak power is 9D squared, which corresponds to this point. The average power is 5D squared. For 4 QAM, so same number of bits per symbol, the average power is, propor the power is proportional to this distance, right, squared. So the total power is 8D squared. The average power is 2D squared, big reduction. What's the peak power for 4 QAM? 2D squared. So that distance squared is the power is proportional to that distance squared. So for 4 QAM, big savings in peak power, 9D squared versus 2D squared, big savings in average power, 5D squared versus 2D squared. So for the same power, I can make D larger in the QAM case and get my symbol error down. It's a big win. All right, thanks. See you next time. Chris, let's do it now.